everyone, Reverend Dorr here from Faith Community Church. We're now in chapter three of our study of the book of Daniel. The events that take place in this chapter are very well known by many. Many of us grew up hearing the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace. It's a story that fuels our faith and trust in God to deliver us as he did them in the midst of our trials. There are many lessons we can learn as we look at the faith of these three young men and the faithfulness of God who delivered them. So if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to please open them up to Daniel chapter 3. And as a reminder, we're using the New Living Translation of the Bible for this study. Let's begin reading from verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages, messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, let me give you a little background as to what's taking place here. King Nebuchadnezzar was a great king of Babylon, and he ruled for 43 years from 605 to about 6, 562 BC, excuse me, 605 BC to about 562 BC. And now during that time, we read in chapter one that God gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over Judah, which began Israel's 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And it was under Nebuchadnezzar's reign that Daniel and his four teenage friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were taken captive and they were brought from their homeland of Judah to be educated for the king's service in his royal palace in Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff, we had learned, changed the four boys' names to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he did this in an attempt to strip them of their Jewish identity. And for three years, they were taught in the ways of the Babylonians. But how many of you know there's an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? Well, we're going to soon see such was the case of these four nice Jewish boys. In chapter 2, we read that Nebuchadnezzar had a disturbing dream, and all of the counselors in his royal service couldn't decipher this dream. Only Daniel could tell him his dream and its interpretation. In this dream, the king saw a great statue with a head of gold, which Daniel explained represented the king and his kingdom. But the rest of its body was not of gold, and it was divided into four parts, and each represented future kingdoms taking over Babylon, becoming ruling world powers over the course of history. Now, if you missed any of these lessons, I encourage you, you can find them on our YouTube channel. Here now in chapter 3, we just read that Nebuchadnezzar builds a gold statue of himself. But notice where the dream he had, only the head was gold, he makes the whole statue out of gold, 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. So it seems like Nebuchadnezzar is trying to make a statement, right? But as we've already learned, beloved, throughout this study, it is God who controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up others, as we read in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. No one can thwart God's plans. This church is the main storyline of the book of Daniel. The sovereignty of God rules over the nations of the earth. You see, church, Nebuchadnezzar could have built that statue 200 feet tall. It would not have changed what God had already decreed. 
the days of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom were numbered. Now let's continue reading from verse four. Then a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zit, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. <laughs> That's quite the ultimatum for these Jewish boys, isn't it? What I love, beloved, about the story of Daniel, that it's written in such a way that we can easily insert ourselves into the story, especially the first six chapters. I wonder, what would each one of us do if we were in this situation? Would we stand up for what we believe, or would we compromise our beliefs in order to save our own lives? You know, there was a time living in America not too long ago, that it would have been hard to imagine ever having to face a trial like this. Today, not so hard. As Christians, we find ourselves more and more sharing in the persecutions of our Jewish and Christian neighbors around the world. Church anti-Semitism is on the rise, and so is the persecution of Christians right here in our own country. I believe this study in the book of Daniel is so timely for us, beloved. I really prayed about this. I really asked the Lord, you know, what book study do you want us to do in 2024? And at the end of 23, he put the book of Daniel on my heart. And I believe this is a book that can help prepare us for what may lie ahead as the day of the Lord approaches. You know, once considered a Christian nation, America has fallen from her roots. And now, not only is this a secular nation, but in many ways, beloved, we're living in a pagan country, one much like the one that was in the world that Daniel lived in many years ago. You know, there are many lessons that we can learn as we study the book of Daniel. So let's pick up the story now from verse 7. <clears throat> it says here, So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king! You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. So here we can see a game of politics begin to unfold. Perhaps it was jealousy for the boys or anti-Semitism. Maybe it was even pride. The Bible doesn't tell us clearly or specifically the exact motivation, motiv motivation rather behind these accusations, but we can be assured, beloved, this was driven purely by evil intent. You know, church, living in a fallen world, we've all had our share of those coming against us with evil intent. It's in times like this, in seasons like this, that our faith is being tested. So how do we respond? You know, one thing I've learned that my response in these situations is directly linked to my time spent with the Lord, my time spent with him in prayer, my time spent with him in worship, 
my time spent with him in the study of his word, my time spent in the fellowship with the saints who edify me and encourage me every time we gather together in church. All these things, beloved, play a role in how I respond to evil intent. You know, church, there's a saying in the world, the world tells you, don't get mad, get even. But God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You see, it takes living a life of authentic faith to respond in faith when you find yourself under fire. When your faith is under fire. When people make false accusations against you or betray you, do you vent your anger or do you confess that anger to God and ask him to give you his wisdom, his heart in this situation so that you can respond authentically? You see, it takes faith anchored in God, beloved, that works by love that's going to see you through that trial. This is the kind of faith we see that Daniel's friends had. Let's continue reading from verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Verses 16 through 18 records their response. Listen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods, or worship the gold statue you have set up. Oh, church, here lies the conviction of those who truly possess authentic faith. But even if he doesn't, what are they saying? These boys are saying, even if he doesn't do it the way we plan, even if he doesn't do it the way we had hoped, the way we had prayed, we will never serve your gods or worship the statue you set up. In other words, these boys are saying, we will never stop believing in our God even if he doesn't deliver us out of this mess. You know, church, there are some trials that God delivers us from, and then there are some trials that God delivers us through. This is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. This is what determines if you truly have biblical faith or not. Faith that will not be shaken is faith that is anchored in God. Church, hear me. Biblical faith is not having faith in an outcome. Let me say that again. You got to get this. Biblical faith is not having faith in an outcome. It is having faith 
in God no matter the outcome. Church faith is not having confidence in our believing. It is having confidence in our God. It is having confidence in his plans and his purposes for our lives, regardless of the outcome. And I know what I'm about to say might rub some people the wrong way, but please hear me. Sometimes, just sometimes, suffering is part of the plan. It was for the apostles. It was for Paul, Peter, James, John, and all the rest. And you know what, beloved? This is not easy to comprehend because many times we don't see it when we're in it. But I want you to know if we keep our faith anchored in him and in him alone, we will see it when the dust settles. Church, listen. Sometimes the problem is part of the plan. As we're about to see in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, after hearing the boys declare their faith in the true God of Israel and their refusal to bow down before the statue, verse 19 goes on to say, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated up seven times hotter than usual. Can you imagine those three young men hearing this right after declaring their faith in God? Yet their faith, beloved, is not shaken. They still would not compromise even to save their very own lives. Why? Because their faith was not in an outcome. Their faith was in God. Their trust was in him, regardless of the outcome. Verse 20, then Nebuchadnezzar ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. Now watch what happens, beloved, as God intervenes, beginning in verse 24. But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Now, the ESV version says the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Well, we know this was not just a son of the gods, but we know, beloved, who the fourth man in the fire was. He was the son of the living God, amen? Many scholars agree that this is what theologians theologians rather call a Christophany, a pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the Trinity, the son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, even though King Nebuchadnezzar calls him in a few moments an angel, we know him as Lord. Amen. Now watch what happens as a result of this appearing. Let's begin reading from verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. 
Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Oh, praise God. Nebuchadnezzar, beloved, recognizes here the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego giving praise to God and acknowledging his greatness throughout the kingdom. Now here in verse 30, we will discover the outcome of this fiery trial. Then the king promoted Shadrach. Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. Beloved, what lessons have we learned from this chapter in the book of Daniel? Well, first, know that our best defense to prepare for our own fiery trials is living a life of prayer, worship, study in the word of God, and fellowship with the saints. Beloved, are you doing these things? Are you living a life of prayer and study in the word? Are you attending church regularly? Well, learn this lesson from Daniel and make a quality decision right now that you're going to put God first and his word first in your life each and every day. Second, make sure your faith is not anchored in an outcome. Make sure when you pray, beloved, your prayers are not anchored in an outcome, but they are anchored in God alone to deliver you, to answer you, however he chooses. Church, listen, these three young men, they had no doubt in God's power to deliver them. But understand, just like many of us at times, they did not know God's plan or his purpose for all of this while they were in the middle of the trial. Church, sometimes we can find ourselves in the middle of a trial, amen? Not knowing God's plan and God's purpose for it. And that's why, beloved, it is vital that our faith be anchored in God and not in an outcome. Amen? And third, the presence of Jesus in this fire, beloved, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a testimony to us that the Lord will be with us when we face our fiery trials in life. Beloved, God is always present. He is an ever-present help in our time of need. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, the Apostle Peter wrote this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Let me close with this promise found in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. It is a verse, beloved, I encourage you to put to memory. Isaiah 43, verse 2. 
when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us this week as we study God's word together. For those of you watching on YouTube, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the like button. I want to encourage those of you who haven't done so already, please join us on our official online church platform. There you can watch our weekly messages when they go live, as well as connect with our church family. Also, don't forget to check out our website at faithcc.com where you can receive additional messages and see our upcoming services. At this time, I want to thank all of you who have been supporting our church and ministry with your financial giving. Guys, you are a blessing to us. Together, we are able to fulfill our mission, which is to transform individuals and families through the gospel into empowered followers of Christ. If you would like to give now, please follow the prompts on your screen. At this time, once again, I want to thank you all for being here. And I want us all to remember, church, as we go through this week, that together we are living truth, changing lives, and loving God. God bless you.